video covers deep learning and convolutional neural networks, or CNNs. Anything with three or more layers is considered deep. Remember that the number of layers is the number of weight layers. So in this example, there are three layers because there are two hidden layers and an output layer, producing three sets of weights. Deep learning is just a catchy phrase for deep neural networks. It's the same stuff. They're trained in the same way. What way is that? Backpropagation. As neural networks get deeper, they have more hyperparameters because there are some issues you can run into. Specifically, there's the problem of the vanishing gradient. Since backpropagation requires that you take derivatives and multiply them together all the way down the network, small multiplications get smaller. So as the gradient is propagated back through the network, it gets smaller and smaller and eventually reaches the limit of the computer, vanishing to zero. Let's go through some of the hyperparameters for a deep neural network that we haven't covered yet. First, nonlinearity. We talked about the activations before in the previous video. These are sometimes referred to simply as nonlinearities. These are hyperparameters because the programmer has to decide what they are and where they go. Each hidden unit in a layer does not have to apply the same nonlinearity. Searching through the space of hyperparameters can be quite cumbersome. Momentum. Sometimes, when we're stepping down to the bottom of the valley, we want to keep in mind the direction we've been going, in case there's a rock or something in the way that doesn't provide us with all the information. This is basically what momentum does. It keeps a portion of the previous update and applies it to the current update. Here we have dw sub n equals eta times dl dw n plus alpha times dw n minus one. Here dw is the update for w. So the first update to w would be eta dl dw and the second update would be eta dl dw plus alpha dw one. Typically, a lot of weight is given to the previous update, so alpha is pretty high, usually 0.9 or something like that. Weight decay is something that we've actually already talked about. We talked about using a regularization term as a part of our loss functions. Several of these regularization terms seek to keep the weights small. Another way to achieve the same result is to use weight decay. This simply decays the weights by a constant factor each iteration or epoch. W new equals gamma W old, where gamma is between zero and one. The step size is something else that's really important. We know that the learning rate is our step size down the valley, so we can get to the bottom. However, there's another hyperparameter called step size, which refers to something different. I know the naming is dumb. I didn't come up with it. Think about this. If you're at the top of a valley and you're stepping, Typically, the valley is very steep at first, and then it becomes more level as you reach the bottom. Think of a parabola. So if you're in a hurry to get to the bottom, you could take bigger steps at first and then smaller steps after a while so you don't overshoot the bottom. This is the step size. The step size tells you when to lower the learning rate or when to slow down. You typically start with a higher learning rate and lower it as training goes on. A lot of time is spent on this so-called hyperparameter tuning. This is because there are so many hyperparameters and so many different combinations of them. Typically, people go with best practice and just use what has worked for someone else in the past. With deep neural networks, there are so many different parameters. So training from random initialization can be hard unless you have a lot of data. This is why most people fine tune their models from existing pre-trained models. So someone has already done the initial work for you. They found an architecture that works well and a training mechanism that works well. Someone has taken a large scale data set and trained a deep neural network to perform a task using that data. That's going to be this one on the left. And you take the network and you train it for your task. So you take all of these and now you change the output layer. So you're solving a different problem. 
Maybe this data set is for object recognition and you have 10 objects, and this one that you're training is for face recognition and you have 10,000 faces. So you're gonna change your output layer so it has 10,000 nodes, and you're going to just slightly adjust your model parameters. So you actually use a lower learning rate when you're fine tuning. You can adjust the network as you like and replace the weights for any adjustments with weight, random weights. This is very common practice. That's it for deep neural networks because they're just neural networks and they're deeper. So they have some issues with training. So hyperparameters are really, really important when you're dealing with deep neural networks. Let's move on to convolutional neural networks. Before we get into CNNs, we have to talk about convolution. What's convolution? It's fancy correlation. What's correlation? Think about it in terms of everyday language. When two things are correlated, they're what? They're related. If two things are perfectly correlated, then they're exactly alike or they're exact opposites. Remember this discussion when we talked about the practicalities of ML? Convolution is basically just that. The convolution operation gives us some sense of correlation between two signals. Let's take these two signals for example. If we run x of t over h of t from left to right, the t dimension, we can see where the two match. How do we do this mathematically? We can multiply the two signals together and sum them up to produce one value for each position of x of t. At the first position, we can see that the functions match exactly, and so we'll get a very high positive value. As we move x of t to the right, we can see that there's less overlap, and so the value will be lower. At the final position, x of t and h of t are exact opposites, and so multiplying them will result in a high negative value. The high positive and high negative value correspond directly to exact and opposite correlations between the two signals. We can do the exact same thing with convolution on a 2D signal. Let's take this for example. If our x of t is a star and we run it across the image h of t, we'll get something that looks like this. If you've taken George's computer vision class, you've probably done this and this looks sort of familiar. But the idea is that you'll get high activations where they exactly match. And in the area around it, you'll get increasing activations until you hit that peak where they exactly correlate. This is exactly what we want to do in a convolutional neural network. Here we have two signals, x and w, and we want to run w over x to produce a convolved signal y. So we place w, which is 3 by 3, over x at the top left. We perform element-wise multiplication and produce one value. If w and x are the same or similar in this area, then y0 will have a high value. Typically, the data is represented in terms of rows and columns, so we have this nice way of representing it, where we just have multiple sums. Here we have a k by k filter. W, in this case, is called a filter. Let's look at a simple example to show how this works. Here we have x, which is 5 by 5, and we have w, which is 3 by 3. We put w over x and do element-wise multiplication and sum, and we produce the first value in y. Then we shift w over by 1, and we get the next value. And again, we do this, and we get 6. So our top row for y is now 9, 7, 6. Now we go down and start back at the left. 6, 6, 6. And then we go to the final placement of w on the bottom left, and we get 5, 6, 8. This is cool because we can see that the best matches for w are the top left and the bottom right, and that's exactly where we get the highest values. And the less of a match with w is for a spot in x, the lower the value is in w, in y. Convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, allow for inputs of multiple dimensions, rather than a simple vector. Instead of connecting every input to every, out, every node in the first hidden layer, we use filters, these two-dimensional set of weights, which are applied in a sliding window like we just did. What does that mean? 
It's actually easier to explain when we visualize it. This shows a fully connected neural network or a deep neural network. This is what we've covered so far. You can see that every input is connected to every hidden node in the hidden layer, H1. And every hidden node in H1 is connected to every hidden node in H2 and so on. That's why it's called fully connected. In a convolutional neural network, we're gonna work a little differently. First, we won't start with vector inputs. We'll start with 2D input like this, or even 3D or 4D. And we'll have 2D filters that replace our individual weights. These 2D filters will be applied at different locations in the 2D input. Remember when we slid W over X just a few slides ago? Each application of a filter will result in a hidden node. So the idea is that one filter, in this case, a five by five, is applied at each location in the input and the result of each application is a hidden node. But each hidden node shares the same weights from the 5x5 five five filter. Each hidden node will have a different activation value due to the different input values. So the application of a single filter results in another 2D layer of hidden nodes. So instead of having something that is 25 by 25 by 21 by 21, that is input size by hidden layer size, weights for this, right? So everything in the input is not fully connected to everything in the output. We actually have five by five. So instead of having way too many weights by connecting everything in the input to everything in the hidden layer, we have five weights for this whole operation. Five by five, 25 weights, apologies. This is what happens when you have one layer and one filter. Typically we have many filters and so the result of applying all of them on the input is multiple 2D hidden feature maps. This is all still technically the first hidden layer, but the first hidden layer now contains many feature maps like this. So if we have 10 filters, we would have 10 2D feature maps in the first hidden layer. Each of the filters in a layer are typically the same size. This process repeats itself with new filters at the second layer. These filters can be the same size as layer one or different. It's up to you. The input two is 2D, so a 2D filter would produce one value. Now we need to go from 3D to one value between H1 and H2, right? Because now we have 2D for each map, but then we have all these dimensions back here because we have so many different feature maps. So if H1 has 10 feature maps and the filters for that layer need to be size W times H, then we also need to have W times H times 10 because we need to apply it all the way through the depth and get one value. That way, for each application of the filter, we take all H1 feature maps into account and produce one value. So after sliding the filter across the full H1 feature maps, we produce one feature map for H2. And again, we do this many times on H2, producing its own set of feature maps. We repeat this process as many times as we like, and eventually we want to make some kind of prediction. Imagine you're trying to classify dog versus cat. So the input is an image, which is typically the case when we're working with CNNs. The model has produced a set of feature maps at the final layer but we need a binary decision. So what we do is we flatten these feature maps like this. So if we have 10 maps that are each three by three, then we'll get a vector that is 10 times three times three, which is 90 dimensions. Then we treat this like a normal neural network and fully connect it to an output neuron or two, depending on whether you're doing categorical classification or not. The output neuron is responsible for making the prediction Y hat. How do we train a CNN? We use backpropagation in the same way that we've learned. There are some little tweaks because of the shared weights. This is not something that I expect you to do in this class, but the basic idea is the same as for DNNs. There are some additional tools used with CNNs to improve performance, each of which becomes its own hyperparameter. The stride tells us how much to move a filter after each application. We've been assuming that the stride is one as we apply it at every location in the image or input. Many times we use a stride of two to subsample the image 
as large images have a lot of redundancy. All you do with a stride is move that many spaces to the right and down between applications of the filter. So a stride of one looks like this, and a stride of two looks like this. And a stride of six looks like this. After we apply a set of filters and get a set of feature maps, we can apply pooling, which takes small areas of the feature maps and applies some operation to them, reducing the size of the feature maps. Typically, max pooling is used, but there are other types, such as average. In max pooling, we take a small area, usually something like 2x2, two two, and output the maximum value in that 2x2 two two window. This is a very common operation and helps to reduce noise by selecting only the highest activations in a window. Padding. If you don't want the size of the feature maps to reduce, you can pad the edges of the input. You can either pad with zeros, called zero padding, or you can pad with the values on the edge of the input. Many times the edges of the input do not matter, so it doesn't necessarily add much. That's it for deep neural networks and convolutional neural networks. The next topic is principal component analysis.